And welcome to the Crash Chords Podcast. I may sound hoarse because I bought a horse. Long story, we'll get into it later. I was going to make that joke, but it would have come out so much better than the way you pulled it off. You sound hoarse? Really? Yeah, you sound so bad right now. Let's not have a who sounds worse contest. Nobody likes that. Okay, I Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, this is not my... <coughs> um, um, rebel, rebel, rebel. Riff, raff. Street, rap. Rebel, schmabel. I don't like Take that. that. Oh, I thought it was like that. It, Take that. I don't buy that. <laughs> oh, that's buy what... That. You Thank got you. it. You're you got it. Um, he's on He's on the podium. At the top of the show, I want to thank Nelson Lugo Horse. again for coming on last week. Uh, we had a blast talking about Steve Power Giraffe. Um, also, since this is probably going to go up on Wednesday like it usually does tomorrow, uh, the Wasties are playing at the Way Station, the last show of the year. There will be some Christmas songs. Come on out, hang out, drink, and rock out. But you don't know they're listening on Wednesday. We're a podcast. We're permanent. We're up there for posterity. So if if it's not past Thursday, come to the show. If it is, you missed it, and it was awesome. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That should be a new segment. There's got to be broad spectrum about this, right? Of the course. The week, the week after we plug something, we should just tell people how awesome it was. That a- actually, a minor tangent: the comedian Paul F. Tompkins on his podcast got hell from listeners because he'd say it's nighttime on the internet, and people would be like, "Well, technically, it could be any time of the day. We can listen to it whenever." And he pretty much <laughs> derp, just, derp, derp, derp. yeah, that's basically what I did right there. I follow you, but so, the, but he, and then Paul F. Tompkins pretty much said, "You know what? Shut up. I don't care." I'm going to say it anyway and continue to still do It's Nighttime on the Internet. I'm going to pretend I'm radio. <laughs> um, so, originally, if you had listened last week, we had talked about how we were going to do Mumford's and Sons' newest record, Babel. Um, but something happened three days ago, which is actually very irregular. Um, one of the more famous pop artists in this country, Beyonce, released a new album overnight. I believe it went on online on iTunes at midnight. Um, fourteen songs, fourteen music videos, overnight, no publicity. Um, it was released on her label, I believe, but not in with the label. Like it was just overnight album drop. It's perhaps not the first pop album, um, and I'm actually saying this in in the vein of pop quiz. You know, yeah. it's a surprise album. There you are. Uh, that's ever been released, but the fact that they were able to uh, hide. First of all, the fact that she's such a well-known star. So you'd think, of course, paparazzi. You're following her around to basically every single thing she does. Uh, on top of that, 14 music videos, which require, require a lot of production value. That's something that's even harder to hide than something that's going on behind studio doors. So all of that, it's, it's kind of impressive. You'd figure she'd have her reasons for doing this. Yeah, well, I mean... be found in the album content. Yeah, we'll get to that. But it's just... It was something kind of too good to pass up. Um, You know, something like this, in a long time at least, I can't think of happening. And the fact that with such a well-known artist, and so many people talking about it, the buzz only over three days has been insane. So Sales have already reached half a million at least. Well, she's a a billboard artist as it is. Yeah. So... Of course, you know, that, that kind of stunt is, is bound to reap some some benefits. And you know it's going to be in the billboard. That's not even a question. So that yeah. itself does not shock me. Well, but the interesting thing is, I don't know if there's a physical album for this yet. I think it's only digital on iTunes. The only place it was released, because it's not on Spotify streaming. It wasn't released on streaming on, on, on iTunes. And you can't buy the tracks individually. Yeah, well, being the, being the ass end of 2013, I... That that in itself doesn't surprise me at all either. But it'll surprise me even less, maybe in five years from now, as that right. gets more common and common. No, of course. It's just, for someone who usually sells so commercially, it's surprising that she released this way. That's all. And it's so down-key. Uh, the whole concept behind the, the, the production and impl- implementation, I got it out right, right? I have to see the rest of the context first. <laughs> of the album itself is just... 
it's kind of it kind of harkens back to the whole underground scene that really isn't underground anymore. That's that's kind of lost its way now. Underground is YouTube with five hundred thousand hits. Mm. That's not really unknown. This was it's sort of like an early Christmas present for our fans. Um, so we unwrapped it. Um, also, <laughs> so obviously this is kind of something that we all just decided we should do because it kind of was too hard. To, it was too good to pass up. Um, I know that there is a lot of talk about the music videos and that they're important. And she's even gone on record as saying this is a very visual album. It's her vision. She didn't want to leave much to interpretation. This is very personal to her. And I understand that. And we could talk about the videos at another time. Maybe do a side podcast, which I'd like to. But the importance of this right now, what we're doing is we're reviewing the album as an audio project, as an audio record. Because when you plug it into your radio while you're driving to work, you're not going to be watching the TV. And it has to stand up on its own. And to be fair, there's a lot of straightforward there's straightforward <clears throat> messages in here. So I understand her comment about uh, not wanting to leave it open to interpretation because her message is fairly straightforward. And I, I do believe that a lot of it is found in the music without the visual aid. Right. And we did watch some of the clips of the video online just to get an idea. And I mean, some of them were more or less exactly what I expected. I mean, the imagery in in the final the the video for the final track which we'll get back to blue very was very much indicative of what I expected a video about that content to be. But we'll get back to that. So we might as well sink our teeth into this brand new record by Beyoncé called Beyoncé. It's a self-titled record. It's also being nicknamed a visual album or the visual album because she did release 14 music videos which is very uncommon that is unprecedented actually yeah complete complete music video encompassing i mean um, it is, that makes it a movie more so pretty much and the album starts with pretty hurts pretty hurts is uh a, i found it to be a great way to start the album this was a message song uh, a very much a get empowered stop relying on outside forces this the whole meaning behind it is is really in your face and she does a great job of of really getting that across in lyrical work what i did enjoy was the combination with some interesting mixing so yeah. the first thing to talk about before we even get into the, the lyrics the song and the mixing is and this is indicative of a lot of tracks on the record it starts with a quote a sound bite um, which happens actually a lot on the record, and is kind of not uh, unexpected for what I expected from a Beyonce record. I don't know that she's done this a lot before, but I certainly wasn't expecting well, it. Sound bites themselves are not terribly uncommon for a lot of hip hop records. There's always sound bites floating around, right. but this is this is more meaningful in that it it it, it strikes reflectiveness. Right. There's a lot of these sound bites are taken straight from her history, from her past. You could. Or at least you you can imagine, you know, a little Beyonce, you know, being put on some show when she was younger. That starts to come up later in the record. There's a, there's a considerable amount of that going on here. Um, and as far as the message of this song, I mean, Pretty Hurts essentially lyrically means... It talks about, you know, our superficial culture and how a lot, can, a lot of people assume and rely on beauty when it shouldn't be always just face value, you know. There's more to life than just right. what's pretty and what's not. Okay, that's pretty hurts. H U R T Z. Yes. A uh, T S. Yeah. Not H E R T Z. Digital yeah. transfer speed. I don't think that enters it. <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> Unless you purchased it that way, then you know maybe. Um, but definitely, I mean, I agree with John. I think it was it was a fairly strong opening track. I mean, there's nothing specific that made it a good intro as far as doing something revolutionary. It's an intro track, but... That's not true. It did introduce uh, something that became very prevalent in the album, and that was... Uh, two things, actually. Uh, a slowdown from the standard pop-slash-hip-hop uh, speed, which is great. I did like she, she kind of took a step back. She did really pace herself a lot in this song, so that it, you can really delve a little bit deeper into the music. And that was the other aspect. The music was interesting. Yeah, the pace, I, I agree with you about the pace. It's, it's definitely, it's more of a breathing kind of album. It's, it's, it's much more slow, much more relaxed. And I do kind of appreciate that um, in the wake of, yes, a lot of other uh, hip-hop work. Not to say that there is not there a fair amount of soul, of course, because they're, they're kind of interchangeable at some court. You some keep point. saying hip-hop work... 
Beyonce is predominantly a pop star. Yes. Oh, sure, but of course she borrows yeah, from hip-hop sure. style things. And yeah. I, I heavily, really heavily. And I wouldn't, yeah, I wouldn't even call her a pop star. I would call her a pop hip-hop star. That's She's a pop hip-hop right. artist. Her, her, spe- her, her vocal pacing is indicative of hip-hop. I mean, I would lean it towards R&B as well, just as much. That's splitting hairs now. All right. The, the the amount of crossover is just. I think, uh, it, I think really indicative is. is the word of the day. <laughs> yes. Anyway, it, um, getting it had, back to the track. It had some great line work, and I really one line that really spoke to me was the soul that needs the surgery, and it was just I I just really enjoyed the metaphor that she starts throwing in this song, the the kind of a turning because it is very face value. You you're able to understand everything, but it is done sweetly. It's done it's done with. Uh, a nod towards a little bit higher alliteration than what you come to expect from pop orientation. I follow you, but I'm, I'm kind of with Matt here in terms of uh, it being sort of a standard pop intro. I mean, there's nothing really, really reaching out about this first track, and I think that's that's basically what you're going to find on a, on, a, on a pop album. You really do need to lure in your audience with something that is very familiar. This track is not really breaking any boundaries, and there was one thing also I did notice that the the layering was kind of it was kind of thick as if it was sort of trying to compensate for a lack of maybe organizational structure or a lack of uh a, a lack of instrumental complexity perhaps so this sort of rang back to that 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 uh the thing we always go back to that we, it's always turned up really really loud you know right. to sort of blur your ears a little bit I was kind of getting that impression for this as a pop track. Still slow, but in terms of the overall volume. But what I would say its strength was as an intro track was it was engaging in the theme of the record and in what we were going to get throughout the rest of the record, which was clearly a very honest, very different Beyonce. She's very much singing about something that... that This is clearly very personal to her, and this is a message that she wants to convey, and an important one about seeing past superficiality and and understanding that it's not just about being you know there's more to life than these very specific things lyrically i out. agree we're getting a different yeah. beyonce yeah. but then that um musically we're getting the same beyonce and that's exactly what you want because that's of course the strong suit throughout this album is that it's beyonce yeah it's probably one of the best pop female singers in the industry and it's you know it's got her signature vibrato all over it it's yeah. just it's oh, the vocals are incredible even yeah. from the start of the first song yeah. and she does on the record as a whole very interesting things with her voice that I don't recall hearing before where she might have I, you know I'm not the biggest Beyonce fan you know I've heard her singles and I know a bunch of her songs but the, she's definitely doing something unique later in the record that I hadn't really heard her well do that before. was in the melodies itself and we'll yeah. get there in terms of her basic vocal quality <laughs> it's though about that's the really the selling yeah, point yeah. you know that's sure. that's why Beyonce is a surefire uh, uh, Billboard 200 hit is because it's it's her quality of voice yeah. people have just grown to love it over the course of time so you know it's got that going for her <laughs> yeah of course um, I guess we'll get right into track two so track two is Ghost slash Haunted it's a two part song It's not the only two-part song. There's one later as well. So this song starts out... um, It has another soundbite intro. um, And... This time, I think the album really... I think this is really the proper beginning of the album to me. Because I do have a tendency sometimes to disregard intros. And you're always supposed to disregard intros. But in this particular case... You know, I'm not drawn into the intro in the same way as I am to this. And it's pretty... It's going really, really serious really, really fast. Yeah. This second track, I'm already going to uh, get ahead of ourselves just to say that this is my favorite track on the album. This song... Okay. Um, yeah. This track was incredible. I think that the pacing of it, first of all, akin to what John said, it's that very slow-natured uh, manner of... The background instrument. She she herself actually can sometimes uh, get fairly quick with the melody, but it's it's that backdrop material that really makes the song and brings it to life. It it's sort of a drone. It begins the the sound bite fades into a drone, and the drone sort of persists in different forms throughout throughout the track sectionally, with the beats stepping in and then stepping out. It's actually very complex, such that it's I really hesitate to even call it a pop track. Well, yeah. I mean, first of all, her style of 
I guess we can say singing in the first half of the track is more spoken word. It's not even hip hop or rap. It's very much just spoken word, almost poetry. It's it's beat poetry. Uh, if it's anything uh, musically related, it's very much a. It becomes a message of hate the haters to some extent. I've not, I really felt very strongly for it. It became creepy. It was especially for Beyonce, it was very, very edgy. It was very um, evocative. It really did an, an incredible job of creating a, a, a really deep, deep current coupled with what became an industrial techno combination in the music. And that's the real thing I want to talk about here. That's what really defines this album musically. Because you need some kind of tone to really hold everything together, or something as vague as it is. And it, there's that industrial nature that is present here. I'll admit that maybe it wasn't so present within the first track, but this properly here in the second track, where everything really gets going, it just hits you like a rock in the head. Yeah. I mean, it's it's not what you'd expect from uh, I, from what I'd expect from Beyonce or from a hip hop record. That it it broached lines with alternative music. At points here, especially in the way the song was constructed, is uh, there's a lot going on. And as far as the message of the track goes, it was less about hating the haters and more about just a frustration, almost a frustration of being her, of being Beyonce. That was more prevalent in the second part, Haunted, where it 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 took a a, a very very interesting turn and became. A more simplistic, forlorn kind of a, a belting out vocal work, uh, where she keeps repeating, "I'm on to you, you're on to me." Just, just the duality, just the the back and forth that 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 she's trying to progress in her vocal work. I should say that's a subtle shift between yeah. these these two parts here. They really blend completely together. Yeah, they're especially, essentially they're essentially two movements of the same track. What what really brought it together was when that original beat poetry gets spliced in with some heavier industrial techno into the haunted part. Yeah. And it, it really did a great job of making me re like stand up and take notice. This was a, this was a song that I was smiling ear to ear because there was just so much going on and I could follow it all. And that was the best part. Yeah. It wasn't too complicated where I was losing some bits here and there. I heard every single chord here. <laughs> It was great. I don't mind too complicated, but this was this was. I, I I I try to shy away from comparisons here, but I do have to say this was more complicated than I expected. Because let's face it, you know, Beyonce. Regardless, many of the music producers behind uh, some of the work that she's done, it's still almost tailor made, kind of toward toward uh, toward a specific audience that has grown up with a certain style of music. Her voice, as I said earlier, is the selling point. That's that's. That's what supersedes everything else. I often am not going to Beyonce for the music, for the sound engineering. It's not something that ever really struck me personally, but here it did. So yeah, that's this a is shift incredible. In and and it does it did say on the Wikipedia article for the for the record that she co-produced the entire record, but she worked with a paragraph of other producers from Timberland to Justin Timberlake. Jay Z helped Boots. There was tons. Pharrell Williams also. Pharrell Williams. And all all of these people and more helped her put this record together, and it gets this. It, it gives you this feeling of, while the message is very personal, it does feel like a collaboration in presentation. I guess is what I'm looking for. Yeah, and I, I think um, this track I really have to single out as the most artistic on the album. It Absolutely. really has to do with the overall form, regardless of the fact that there's that there's two movements. It's it's even the sections within that the the, the points in which they choose to to cut out a certain beat. Now, I know this might seem like on the face of it, it might seem like a simple matter of looping and getting cutting out the loop and then re-entering the loop, but it was really artfully done. Yeah, within the looping realm, you know, that's that's still nothing to sneeze at, because. That's all that stands in the way from uh, a sound gen engineer between something uh, tailored or something cut and paste and yeah. greatness. It's between those two. And this this really was on the high it's, end of the it spectrum. It shows that Beyonce clearly has an ear for for something more than just putting out pop music. She, she There are other layers, and this song was made to convey that. 
Yes, and I want to go back to something you said much earlier. You said this very early in the album. You had said that it sounds almost like there's a chip on her shoulder. Yeah. It's something that I definitely heard early on. It, 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 there's a frustration here, and especially with the construction of this track, uh, the whole composition of it, I felt like it was her trying to break out of a boundary, sort of. Well, it's yeah. like if she's been put in a box, perhaps, I mean, pretty, as artists do. And Message Pretty Hurts has spoke to that, too. You know, very much, oh, she's just another pretty face. It's not about anything else. And, yeah. You know, she's clearly writing this record from a place, and that's why I think some of the tracks that we might disagree on later stand up a little bit, is clearly she's making this record... And it's shown in the release. She didn't want the advertising. She didn't want the promotion. This is her record. This is her, and she put it out, you know? Yeah, it's got independence written all over it. All over it. Let's move on to track three. So this is her first um, song where she works with someone else. She's working with her husband, Jay-Z. Um, it's called Drunken Love, and it's featuring Jay-Z. I saw something in this track, and I don't know if the other if you two saw it, and I didn't want to mention it till now. Drunken Love... I feel like during the song, the progression for me from from beginning to end, I felt like she was getting drunk. And I'm going to explain it this way. Her voice undergoes a, a fairly dramatic change from the beginning where it is very clear and beautiful. And by the end of the song, I love that she's starting to slur, that the music is starting to get a little bit off key, that she's starting to to get into that whole repetition phase of drinking where she's good doing lines like graining on the wood, graining, graining, I'm swerving on that, swerving, swerving. I, I just love that, like, she, she's really showing full force the depth that she's going into here, the the diving deep into the alcoholic beverage of love and, and just drinking it in. This is pulled back, is, is work with, this works with, a, a really good pullbacking beat work, almost like the the tones are not being done full force, where they're kind of going just just ending a, a a fraction of a second too early, or being drawn back a little bit more. That I just found intriguing in this song. Well, I'm half with you here. There's certain things to note. For instance, I do think there's one thing to mention, especially in terms of vocal quality. I think that this track is the breakout track. For her vocal skill, her her personal virtuosity, I think that this is really where it really shines. At the same time, when it comes to the mixing, because you brought that up, I honestly have to say I thought it took a little bit of a backseat. Now, I, I that kind of go coincides with what you described that there was that pullback there, uh, so as perhaps not to cloud the the narrative in which she's telling, which I could almost detect a bit of a drunken spiral yeah. over the course of the track. Uh, Either way, I'm not so sure that there was that marriage between the mixing and her vocals as there was in in Haunted. And that and yeah, that's the problem of coming off a track that you completely were immersed in. Well, and also I think, though, a part of that might have been intentional, the fact that there wasn't that complete marriage. That disparity was kind of... If, if to suggest John slipping John away thing, from reality as yeah. you go. Yeah, and I followed and, and And also, I mean, I just thought it was done very well... You you clearly get this narrative of being so in love. You're drunk on the love of this other person. You're no longer thinking clearly. You're no longer really able to go from point A to point B in your life because it, you everything gets blurry. Uh, things are starting to become askew. I, by the end of this song, I'm really feeling that. I'm really enjoying how that idea is meshing up in the portrayal of the music and the portrayal of her vocals. Yeah, but I didn't get that in the music. I didn't get that the music was blurring. Aside from there simply being a disconnect, uh, that's not enough for me. I need a little bit more than a disconnect. Maybe the music could have been a little bit, you know... Well, I'm not going to make suggestions here. But it was just... It It didn't feel drunk to me. That's why I'm a little... I'm a little... I'm not quite buying it. It's Okay. Sure. I forgive you. Sure. Okay. Um, I'm no, forgiven. I mean, clearly, clearly. But, all's, but, all's well. But definitely I agree with Steve, though, from the vocal perspective. I mean, the singing in this song definitely stands out. I mean, she she does... Both with the beginning of the song and the end of the song, she does stuff vocally that really does show why, she, why she's Beyonce. You know, she has the skill. And, of course, Jay-Z... The the rapping that he does is solid. Wow, when I say the rapping, I couldn't sound any more out of touch. Um, 
but but his that his, they're rapping he does yeah. yes uh, that, actually go. that was worse go. thank you thank you Steve <laughs> I feel better uh, father from American Pie there um, but no his 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 uh, lyrics are solid and his delivery is solid you know Jay Jay Z is is great at what he does and he's one of the one of the rappers that I don't even have to know his work very well whatever I hear by him I tend to like because he's just very good at it he's a great businessman and he's a great great lyricist I'm gonna play devil's advocate to this though. Uh, I do come from a standpoint where I am a little bit ambiguous. Well, that's luck putting it lightly. I'm edgy around certain tracks that have the insert random rapper. Now hold up, because he's not just any random rapper. He's the husband. He's the, the rock, and that'll come up later. So his presence is kind of important, especially in a track called Drunk in Love, You Have Man and Wife. That su- sort of supersedes the insert random rapper, insert very important and related rapper. So his presence there isn't anything to sneeze at. Regardless, I- there is an- there's a delivery that goes with that-, that rapping interlude that I do feel sometimes takes away from the immersion. It's just a, it's a personal problem that I sometimes have here. I... It's not just against the rapping in general, because if a song had been in, in rap entirely, you know, then th- that's the immersion. I can get on board with that. I did not feel that strongly in this track. There was that, that, that issue happening. Yeah, no. But not, there, that is an not issue. Not as much as later. Yeah, that is an issue because Beyonce sings. When she raps, she's still singing. Yeah. That's, that's the whole thing. That's why she's pop plus. <laughs> yeah, I, I like kind that. of disagree with Steve for this track. I understand where you're coming from. I just don't get that here. However, later in the album, we all get that on one of the other tracks. Um, I just, I don't agree at all on this track. But I can see where you would see that, especially considering I know you aren't a huge hip-hop fan and you do feel that sometimes inserting a rapper is very tropey. I just don't get that sense here. I, I know. I just, you know, you gotta go someplace beyond simply going like, oh yeah, JG, Jay-Z entered, entered the rap song. Hey, great, gotta respect, gotta respect. You know, hey, it's just, well, it's I, you gotta go a little bit beyond that. It, well, yeah. It's the use of, of it is kind of important. Yes, I mean, but it was not a matter of respect. It's a matter of I enjoy his rapping and he yeah. rapped well on the song. Yeah, it was more of an inevitability for me rather than a like, ooh, on-point artistic decision. Well, yeah. I felt like he was going to be there. <laughs> no, um, ifs, and he plus. better. He <laughs> there better. you are. This and this is this is another song though that furthers my chip on the shoulder theory because it's a very aggressive love song. Quotation that, marks. right there, right there. That's the word aggressive. Yeah, it's, that actually describes a, a huge portion of this album. Yeah, and this song for sure. Like she's a you know, it's a very aggressive. Love song. It's still a love song, but just it's it's very much. Considering by some of the slower songs of this album, though, I'm going to curtail that word a little bit. I think you were well, you were more you were more correct with the chip on your shoulder. There's no. frustration here. No. Aggression. Eh. We have an extremely aggressive song. We have next. one. Next one. <laughs> blow. Oh. It, oh. Blow. Even this. All right. Oh. Blow. I would like to uh, put out a little parental advisory at this point. We don't often have to do that, but there's really only one word to describe this song. If you were to boil it down to one word, explicit. Yeah. This song is very much and very clearly an instructional on how to go down on a woman from the woman's perspective, more or less. There's a little more to it than that, but it's very much that. I can joke and say I was taking notes, but... It's very... But that would be seedy. (laughs) The whole thing is, it's very thinly veiled, explicit content, and I think, just from my perspective, at this point in my life, I'm really done with this overly explicit content. It really felt kind of hollow to me, uh, the way it was being portrayed. I, I just, I, to be honest, I really just don't know how to take this, other than saying I did not enjoy it. Um. Okay, I'm gonna be equally cur- curmudgeonly here. I don't want to be, because here's here's the here's the rub. This is an incredibly catchy song. Really, really, goddamn catchy. Like it's it's almost unavoidable. Does that funk? bass in there, you're immediately dropped into the 70s, and I mean like the best of the 70s, the best that ever came out of the funk industry, in sort of, yes, a repetitive riff, but what a great riff. 
I was thoroughly immersed in the music here, such that I almost kind of wanted to avoid the, um, the explicit nature of the lyrics. Not because I'm some kind of prude who doesn't, you know, I don't need that in my music. It's not about that. It's about what else is really there. Apart from simply the catchy song, I guess, but I, I guess I needed more of a, a deeper message to go along with it. I mean, it, initially there was this level of what I thought was cleverness, but it, by by the middle to the end of the song, it becomes. It, she's. I mean, it's hard to not say she's not doing this just for, for shock value, and you don't honestly know. Obviously, we're not in the same room as her. She's writing the song, but just on the surface, at least, it does seem very shock value. But I agree with Steve. I think the song is catchy. I mean, personally, I mean. The lyrics aren't enough to deter me. I I do enjoy the song, but it can seem a little aggressive in its sexuality. I could see people singing along, going, turn that cherry, turn that cherry. (laughs) I just don't want to see 14-year-old girls who are going to be getting this album doing it. Yeah. That's another I didn't even thing. want to take it in that direction, but you make a good point because that's you know where this always has to go as well. What's your audience? To, how is this going to affect your yeah. audience? How is this going to affect the next generation? Um, I'm I mean, I'm sure there'll be a parental advisory on this album. So, and from I, Pretty Hurts, I'm a little hesitant. Uh, the next song, No Angel, and some of the later tracks really are just great. Like, to be honest, young girls should hear some of these songs. They yeah. really should. They are. They do portray a great message. And it's Beyonce. They're going to listen. That's but a good something point. Like, so, I, I don't understand Blow on the same album as well, this. Well, the, the, yeah. the great... I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll take it there. Since the, I, I know that there are fans of Beyonce who are much younger. I mean, my niece is one of her favorite songs is Single Ladies. And the idea of her listening to a song like this makes me uncomfortable. You know, for an adult who can handle their own sexuality, you know, then it's your own personal preference on what to do with this song. Of course. But but the idea that someone that young could hear a song... Now, obviously, it's not Beyonce's problem or fault. It's the parent. And, you know, the parent, if they don't want a child to hear a song they're not supposed to hear, they should pay more attention to the music they're listening to. Yeah. So that has nothing to really do with anything. You know, if you're Beyonce well, and you want to... That's why I was even hesitant to take it in this yeah. direction. I didn't want to take that, that stereotypical critic standpoint. Like, young girls shouldn't hear this and whatnot. But it's, I'm really, I really want to keep this to the art of the song. Yeah. But that's something I'm going to start talking about in this album. I don't see how it connects with the previous work. See, me neither. I don't understand the story or the arc or the theme or what's being built upon here. I, it has some connection with drunk love, drunken love, but it really just takes such a hard left turn at the corner of that street between love and lust that I just I don't know where it's. I mean, going I don't want to be coy though because I think Matt's raising his because I think I do know what the theme kind of is here. It's a lot. It's very much empowerment. Yeah, I and mean, and the, there is that double standard. Um, I'm sure there's a double standard in terms of you know the. Oh, there, yes, that's right, yes, <laughs> you know, in terms of sexual, well, I mean, like, it, that's typically, yeah, it seems to be a, a lot of a uh, male-to-female thing, then again, on always. The, on the very surface of this, I think the level of this song, and, and yes, I can honestly see where you would skew and see that it does feel very almost gratuitous, but my idea of the song is what it's supposed to represent is just very much Beyonce being very frank about what she likes and what she thinks a lot of. A lot of women like. Uh, but I don't know if that belongs in an album necessarily. Right, and and that's a fair judgment. But I'm just saying I think that's where the perspective is, and that's the connection to it being very personal for her. And that's where I say I do have respect for Beyonce because, well, she does something like this, and like you said, it's got really a very good beat to it, a very good music to mm-hmm. it. So it's not like it's not going to be on radio and everything like that. Maybe. It's not like people aren't going to fall in love with a song like this if they're adults and... I mean, like, it's just that there's there's just... Well, hold up here. There's a very appropriate comparison for a song like this, especially considering we're bringing this on as a relevant album. It's very popular. A lot of people are going to be hearing it. So let's mention something else that had kind of a similar uh, reaction, and that was uh, Robin Thicke and his Blurred Lines track, which only came out just a few months ago, that track received a very, very similar reaction. Now, first of all, we're not too deep in uh, 
this record hasn't been around long enough to, to see if there's any flag. To be honest, I'm not even sure if there's going to be any whatsoever. Uh, because Beyonce is kind of, I guess, shielded by her o overtly awesome vocal capabilities that probably a little bit of that she can sing whatever she wants. Um, but there was very much that, that male chauvinism that came out with uh, Robin Thicke's Blurred, Blurred Lines. Lines. But that's the irony here. I could almost catch a bit of a blurred line in the fact mm. that this song would get the pass. But the, but the, but the which different... makes me retrospectively <clears throat> defensive of that. Nah, but but the chauvinism in blurred lines isn't the same as the sexuality in in blow. I don't see that very direct connection. I mean, I, I just I don't. You know, I understand what you're trying to say is that it. You know, but I think the outrage for Blurred Lines was for a very different reason. It wasn't because it was sexual. It was because of how chauvinistic the song was and how inappropriate the song was on the whole. Whereas Blurred Lines... The mere claim that that there's Blurred Lines. I mean, it's, it, it's kind of a tricky one. I can understand that going both ways. I still would probably make the claim that uh, what he did... And I don't want to make this all about Robin Thicke here, but I still would make the claim that what he did was really no different than a lot of other uh, gratuitous music in the past 20 years, ever since Madonna, essentially, I still say that he really was not breaking any boundary. He just, he had his own point and he said it. Well, in a way, this track is not so much even a point as it is just, here's lots and lots and lots of sex. Really, really graphically. I, I it's, that almost demeans a little bit further. That if there's not even a point here, regardless of whether, you know, it raises controversy or not, okay, great, it's not going to raise controversy because it's a straightforward gratuitous thing but that that in itself isn't beneficial i would almost prefer something that raised eyebrows rather than just sex for the sake of sex mm. i I'm, I'm siding with steve on this one that's 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 where a lot of the issue where it comes with here i just it becomes a point where i just gotta ask yeah okay this is you're taking control i can understand that from a macro perspective. It's Beyonce taking control. It's women taking control. Yeah. But it's presentation, the, the the lyrics. I have to I have to shake my head and say why? Like why did you did you do it like this? Yeah, and I'll, I'll even I'll even uh, go a little bit half and half with presentation because if you're going to boil it down to the art here, I mean, it is sung in a pretty. Uh, intriguing meter you know you when you when you put all the all the the lyrics work regardless of how gratuitous they are it like it goes hand in hand with the catchiness of of the backbeat which is so mind-numbingly driving that you can't help but really kind of bob your head along to it it's still that overall though where is the where is the depth in here as the it, the subject matter is just kind of it's it's blunt yeah no. Bluntness itself, though, is not always a saving grace. No, yeah, I can see that. Yeah. I mean, also, I, personally, I don't have a problem with sex for the sake of sex. But I can understand how, you know, because, I mean, I, I, it's just, do you understand what I'm saying? I, I, I have no problem with the bluntness of something just being sexual, but I can understand how something being so so bluntly sexual can be disconcerting to some and or offensive to others and it no, was it's just whole, me it's, it's it leaves you wanting more ironically yeah if i'm left wanting more from a gratuitous porn scene that then you did something wrong artistically <laughs> that's that's really the problem yeah like no one looks at a at, at a at a porn film and says "Ooh, that's high art there there are many you know it, it, it's it has a use right. i feel like that I don't want that in the middle of an album that has many other uh, really pointed things here. I don't want to. I don't want to make this the entire topic of the album. No, and it's I can, just it, it's it's a whole. Um, I I mean I can part. understand that more than anything else is the fact that it does seem incongruent to the rest of the record, other than it's as personal. It could be as other personal. than the personal empowerment yeah. and everything. But that's that's the extent of empowerment here. Is just that's how you do it. Ah, that's just not enough for me. Let's move on to the next track, because I feel like we could keep going on this one. Um, the next track is No Angel. Um, this is a contender for my favorite. And the reason for this is Beyonce does an amazing job in the inflection of her voice. It was just in the intro. In her verses. It was also in the outro. 
Yeah, there was um, it was a very very interesting thing we discovered that there's there's a meter that she does there, which is really it's it's almost the simplest thing. At the same time, it's the inflection that really carries it along, where her inflection actually implies that there is a more complex meter than there really is, which is a rather clever thing at uh, from an again from an artistic standpoint, uh, from a musical standpoint, that's just that's brilliant to me. I I. You wouldn't think that's something that could fool you. To make uh, inflection fool you into believing that there's a different meter than there really is, which is actually really simple. It's yeah. an odd thing. It does a little bit of a number on your head, but she's uh, she's stylistic in her delivery. And it's the I, I do enjoy the backbeat immensely. It's a very uh, dark-oriented uh, techno-pop combination that I just really fell in love with. Uh, when she was going through the bridges and you could, uh, she was going through the choruses and you could really hear it and it really accented her going from this weird inflection meter work to very short clip in it forceful single word lines. I just love the way she was doing it. Yes, that's, that's that meter I was talking about. That's the, um, just one more thing though, because considering you started out, um, uh, talking about the, the backbeat there, there was something about about the sound engineering here, which sounded very, very 80s, like incredibly 80s, which is sort of interesting that the previous track is sort of pulling from the 70s, this pulling from the 80s. It almost seems like a walk through the last uh, 30 years. We get an, we get a song coming up that uh, ends up in 90s uh, R&B. Yeah. Uh, this song, for me, what really stood out about it is it started almost basic. You know, there wasn't a lot of layers to the... It was very much focused on this this interesting meter of her voice. It was very much to showcase her voice. But the bri- the pre bridge and bridge had such great techno and keyboard work that it really even drew you in even more. Yeah, the layering it was the build up, the punctuation, like everything just meshed on this for me. That's why it's just so highly. And rated. the message of the song is very much you know, you're gonna be it. It, be, it boiled down to for me, you're gonna be a bad man. Well, I'm gonna be a bad girl too. Like. Just because you want to... To to the point that you're no angel, neither am I. The idea of this acceptance that neither of us are perfect, neither of us are going to be the... You know, we're not the the idea of perfection and good. And also, to some extent, to some extent, don't hurt me because I can hurt you back. Yeah. I got that kind of a vibe from it as well. (laughs) That's a chip on your shoulder. I I didn't quite catch that, but that that is it. And, And I just... It was very self-affirming I just enjoy it it was it was very well done uh, I want to go back to uh, music here because I'm glad see this is this is the contrast uh, that we're discussing that I feel really is important with regards to the previous track here art the amount of things she includes artistically like it's that disparity between the music and her vocal stylings that makes the song sound almost a little bit demented and that really kind of enhances that chip on her shoulder feel to me, like the use of of those those drones in the background, those '80s style uh, synth work. It's so awkwardly dissonant. Like, it actually works against her voice in places, such that I can feel that that um, that friction between her and said person. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I mean, it it does come up more later, too. But essentially, this song is very much a great, um, not composition, but a great mix, as well as a great style of singing that kind of pulls it all together with lyrics that are very well thought out as well. Also had kind of an 80s noir film feel. Yes. Yeah, that's, that's um, Which that's makes good. me want to see that's the really video what I, this. Uh, because I'm I'm curious to see if the video has the same, which I imagine it might. There you are. Um, moving on to the next two-part song, um, Yance slash Partition. So this is another somewhat, I don't want to say gratuitous, I want to say explicit song. We can get into a discussion about how explicit it is, but it, it starts with another soundbite clip, and then very much goes into this kind of very hip-hop style um, that, I mean, regardless of how blunt the song is, her, you get a sense of how well Beyonce can rap as well as sing on this song, and, I mean, she's very good at it. And with the two parts, I found something in this song that I really found missing from Blow. 
which is why I have such issues with Blow. Because here, I actually see clear cut there is a message. She's talking about, in the first part, the invasion of her privacy and how she really became, uh, she really lost all sense of being alone because she really isn't alone. There's always people around her, whether it's the paparazzi, people she's working with, uh, whether it's something as simple as all the, the, the various people that she has to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. She lost the ability to just be with her husband. And that's what this song is about. And yeah, it does get graphic uh, towards the end of it. But it really does speak to that. Speak to the to, to the loss of, of, to some extent, the innocence that she had in her relationship with her husband. Also, just the... the... The bluntness of the imagery there is what I really, really love about this. It's um, it's part the partition is the limo itself, and they conveyed that in the music, which is just beautiful. It was part of of the sound engineer as the, the intro. You hear muffled sounds, muffled sounds of voices. That's your your audience. There's people outside, and I could immediately sense that that it's through a car. Like, be, you're on the inside, that's them on the outside. That is your partition. That is everything that separates your privacy from from the rest of the world. It's a car window. And to some extent, it actually becomes slanderous. And I love that idea of the 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 jackals of our society. The, the, the I'm calling them out, the TMZ people and everything like that. Really just doing everything they possibly can to sell rags. And she does a great job of really calling them out without ever really calling them out. And I just I just really, well, yeah, maybe a, a little more oblique on her metaphors. Maybe that might make me a little bit more into it. But I really <laughs> enjoyed the presentation of this. Yeah, no, and I, the two-part nature was really good. I'm 100% with you there. There's that... There's that there's that split there, and I agree the obliqueness of her metaphors could probably have made this um, an all-around great track, but as it stands, it's still very clever. And, th again, the way she conveys the imagery in the track has that chip on her shoulder, too. Like, I'm doing these things, I'm in this limo. But it's, you know. it's the very clear, <clears throat> defined two parts. Yeah. The external world, the internal world. Yeah. The everything else and the family. Yeah, I the think, husband, the kids, every the the life that she wants and the life yeah. she has. I think Yonsei, it's very partition. Funny. There's a two parts. <laughs> These yeah. are, I mean, it's almost a straightforward kind of thing, but it's it's it is it is cleverly done. Yes. Uh, moving on to the next track, Jealous, track seven. So, uh, Jealous is the first track we really get on this record, besides maybe in sound anyway, pretty hurts. But Jealous is very much has this feel of a very standard pop track. It's also only like three minutes and 30 seconds. Um, Which is surprising for this album. The album actually tends to be a little bit longer. The the thing that, you know, still stands up for the for the song is it's still very much, there's a very personal message in this track, um, you know, and you get a sense of that um, very quickly. And this was a, a, there was something here, and while the music the music really wasn't stand outish, I did notice that the music does progress with the story that's being presented here, and the story is the idea of a woman being trapped, jealous of her husband because she's left alone. She 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 really doesn't. She's not with him because he chooses not to be, and she has this hollow life, and it really starts off as a very echoing hollow music and as she starts to take back control of her life the music starts to begin to flourish the only issue well no the main issue with this song that i have is it's really kind of a very tried and true setup there's nothing here that really speaks to uniqueness except really the duality of the the vocal lyrical work and the progression of the music yeah and i'm gonna be the stickler here that's kind of where I, uh, I I sort of drew the line with this track. The pop the pop structure itself. Um, I hate to speak about it so so generally, but it, there was just I don't know something about this did not lure me in to those other factors. It just it had to do with like, that's 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 the first line of defense, and I I, I couldn't get past it. 
I mean, this song does what a lot of the songs on this record still. It's clearly a very personal song. It's she's singing very much from the heart, I and mean, the lyrics convey that. But musically, it's nothing special. I mean, it's it's not bad by any means. It's just it's you know it 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 kind of follows the tropiness of a standard pop track. I really I really just viewed it as a, an attempt at something really really great, and the core is there, but like the fixin's got to be. Brought up a little bit, <laughs> oh, a, a bit, like uh, a little, yeah, yeah. I mean, like a little bit better meshing. Yeah. Uh, Let's hit uh, Rocket <clears throat> Track Eight. Rocket. This uh, is your '90s R&B track. At least was... you know the the. Uh, I think it's going to hit you if you have any knowledge of '90s R&B. So in this, in sound especially musically, it was very much a standard '90s R&B track. It it could have fit in back in the days of Montel Jordan and and a lot of that stuff of the '90s. You know, the thing that made it stand out is lyrically. So this is another very sexual song. Um, this obviously speaking more about the act of sex um but this... but it was more clever than blow because it wasn't very as blunt there was more metaphor that was more and it also very much felt like it was less sex and more romantic uh, the r&b style the, the really slow tempo of the r&b uh made it much more sensual instead of gratuitous that the the metaphor work that's going on here and there's a lot more metaphors going on here um though they, they're fairly easy to see through well, it also i just do... love i love that that combination it really do, does come off i agree with as that nice and hot and heavy part the reason for that central nature i think is because of the background there. there was the chorus the chorus steps in there was that call and response nature with the chorus which is almost gospelish yeah so well, I don't know where I, where I somehow connect gospel and sensual, but there, it was a very rousing. Uh, the the duality yeah. between the two was rousing, so hence arousing, perhaps. Um, I mean, I can definitely see that connection very easily. It does also speak to the theme of the album, where she's coming off and she's singing like she's the submissive of the relationship, but she takes a very controlling stance on what's going on here that... I just, I, I just see it also just perpetuating even, this theme work. I don't even get the submissive sense on this. She still sounds very much in control on this song. No, no, she speaks to like what, what her lover likes, what what it, what she, what he likes her to do. Right. But she still has a firm hand on the tiller, so to speak. That just really it, it creates a good combination between the two. It, it's again one of those answers to blow where I feel this is just pushing it in such a it's a, it's a more it's a mature direction um, her play on words here yes it is still fairly face value but there is an attempt there is really an attempt to be kind of playful with this right with this track a playful um, I think is the best way to describe it you get that playful nature even in the sexuality of the song now, I even got that in in, in the meter of, of certain uh, certain phrases here yeah. I'm proud of all of this bass. Let me put it in your face. Enter bass. You know, like yeah. it's pretty blunt in that regard. But that that's that's musical comedy right there, yeah. as, as opposed to uh, comedy with music. Yeah. That's that's using the music to your advantage to to um, create a moment. Yeah, to create a moment of a little ha. That's 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 been done since like classical age, and I still like to see it. Not often done anymore, but it's still done. The yeah, one other thing here is just that there were very impressive sections in the song, in terms quarterly speaking. I really wanted to be immersed uh, in certain sections, and definitely it did work. I started to notice that there, this was the theme throughout most of the album here. There would be moments in the mixing that can sort of change your mood on a dime, uh, just in terms of one chord shift to the next, which again is fairly uh, abnormal, I think, for a lot of uh, her previous music. Normally, it's it's pick a mood, pick a good mood, and stick with it, right? Ride with it and, and make it the best mood you can possibly make it. This album as a whole is definitely playing more with a, 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 an ups and downs. There are a range of emotions in this album, yeah. for sure. It's, Absolutely. Uh, yeah, it, it's, it's, al it's almost schizophrenic. But right, I, and I, to a very, very clever degree. Yeah. Like I, I, it, it's, it's accentuated in the music itself. Yeah, which also very much makes it feel that much more personal because it's kind of... Emotionally, you're not always in A or B. Sometimes you jump from A to B and then hit Z. You know? Well, it also speaks and, to the nature of intercourse 
I was just going to say that. And that, that, is... that sort of, there's, there's always that cusp and those points where things kind of slow down or speed up or stop or get too hard or too soft. You took the words right out of my mouth. That was, it, that was it, really right. the... It, music, it became music, it became sex music and not porn music or anything like that. It became you said the it musical best earlier. equivalency. This is, the, this is the song for making love as yeah. opposed to just raw sex on a plate. This this is a really really cleverly done track, and, and it's as I said. Whereas those those ups and downs tend to be used uh, throughout the album here uh, to change various forms of mood, it was really cleverly used in this particular track for that specific purpose, for that explicit or <laughs> expressed purpose. Yes, um, <clears throat> let's hit uh, the next track, which is mine, M I N E, mine, featuring Drake. Um, so we alluded to this track earlier when we were talking about the Jay Z tra- featured track. Um, it's a piano. It starts as this piano ballad. It's kind of got this soul searching feel, this struggle. But <laughs> but the the problem with it is that it seems so so I, so invested in this man. <laughs> well, the problem is is so Beyonce as always her voice sounds very you know it's beautiful and she draws you in. But the problem is it's interrupted. By these moments with Drake. And I mean, Drake's not a bad rapper as far as I know. He's very acclaimed. A lot of people like him. He's in the pop stratosphere, but he's a rapper. But no, his but styles, you said it. This his is styles the moment. and vocals really don't match. His, his this lyrics... is the moment I described earlier. With regards to Jay-Z making an intro, entrance, well, that I could have given a pass. But this really just... This, was, this is my stereotype here. His, this is the prime example of, of a rapper sort of stepping his foot in the middle of a track, which just pulls me away from the story completely. Well, the problem is, is that, again, Beyonce sounds so sincere in what she's singing, and then Drake does not. Drake is just... He sounds like he's standing in the record studio. He's there. He's, he's, he's at a microphone right now. I don't want to listen to a track and simply picture that that's really poor imagery as far as it's concerned if i see the actual production at play because it's such a tropish thing it's st- it featured rapper featured artist it's full of feature featured everybody i'm just let the song be the song and while what beyonce is singing is the introspective being forced apart because they have so much going on in their lives between her and jay-z and the back and the forth and all that issues Drake comes off as kind of conceited. I can't be with you, girl. I mean, you you ain't good enough for me. I ain't good enough for you. Or it really comes off as kind of conceited. Loses that introspective nature. Loses that deeper trying for a meeting. And and just comes off as kind of campy. It does come off as campy. Although I will buy that perhaps that's useful uh, as as a duality there. Where... If you're trying to show the opposite side of something, you know, as an artist, she's she is speaking her inner feelings, of course, uh, and just as you said with regards to Jay Z, if 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 the duality she wants to express is not that of a mutual affection, maybe it's 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 kind of on point that Jay Z is not in this particular track, because you would simply take him out of the equation and insert random guy, insert what any guy would say in that position. Basically, the stereotype that she's conveying. So, Drake does kind of serve that purpose. I'll give it that much credit. I still say that it didn't work from a musical perspective. But if it's, it's intentional, then I could see why she might have done that. Yeah, but that's that's a abstract thing. It doesn't work with the music too There's well. There's not really mu- that much more to say about this track. It's Elvia Wolf lyrically. That's the other thing here. I mean, I don't know. Her, her whole shtick is is love heartbreak sex love loss heartbreak so i want to like this track in a little bit of a deeper sense to sort of make a greater point about any one of those things which at this point in the album i'm starting to realize is a little bit sporadic sometimes great on point perfect you know way to spin a long existing theme that could probably be spinned any number of ways and then other times it's just it's just a little bit weak. It's very much the word itself. It's right. either the love or the heartbreak or the loss and merely that. So, you know, I'm looking for that deeper level here and it's just eh, she sort of threw, threw me a loop in terms of uh, whether she's going to go full force or not. 
Right. And it kind of gets perpetuated in the next song, XO. Uh, I did enjoy that nice intro, but then it sort of became, once again, a little campy for me. See, it, it, it didn't really feel to be deep. I, see, I've got to disagree. XO, I agree that it was kind of, in a, in, from a sound and music perspective, it was kind of very another very standard sounding pop song. But as far as emotionality goes, I mean, this this song is clearly designed to convey a very, just very simple love, a compassion, you know, a very much reaching out, I love you, I want to kiss and hug you. It's, it, it, it's non-sexual and it's very much just an affection. But I lost a lot of that personality that we had in the previous songs. This did not seem personal to me. Well, this felt like the end gre- credits of a romantic comedy. It felt like just something so as you're walking out the theater, you remember that last little splash. That's why this is an appropriate time to mention the genre shifting going on in this album. I mean, there's been so many uh, so many switches from one to the next, and I, I could I could buy a few of them, especially for the guy that we went from 70s to 80s. I'm, it's almost like we're getting snapshots of her influences, or perhaps her life. And, you know, I'm sure a lot of this music was present and in her... Um, in her influence, this is the reason why she became the pop star that she did. Uh, this one was a bit strange, though, because it really didn't strike me as you know. I, I don't really hear Beyonce's music in this. It seemed more like like a bit of pandering toward a more generic brand of pop than Beyonce's. I almost likened this sound to the kind you'd get from Fun. Or from One Republic. It was very familiar to One Republic sound, and that's, yeah. and, and, which is not a sound that I hate, but I can see where you're coming from. It did. It, seem, it's a matter of its place in the album. Yeah, it's it very seems, odd considering the previous strange. material. The previous material really worked hand in hand. This one's a whole. And I can definitely see that. I mean, it's uh, it's followed up by such a great song. I just. There's this really lacked the personality. There's even personality in blow in mind that I really feel. Well, just Whether from a musical I'm, perspective, at least that you have the you have the beat to groove to and all that. This eh, it's just a little empty. You know, this is your where, where this, this is your fist pumping on the ceiling, which is just a little bit empty at the end of the day. The last the last four tracks are really just full of stuff. Like this one feels like it it feels a little phoned in. Well, I think also, though, with its placement, it might be a little odd, but I think this is also supposed to give you a momentary breather. Here's just a nice, sweet song. I consider that. I love that. I w- I'll try to accept it as that, because you know, its placement, well, it's a little late in the album, but, you know, it is a breather, considering the previous songs were fairly depressing. And then the 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 end of the album goes from extremely depressing to extremely happy also it goes happy. It, go, it will get oh, to it's that bitter, we'll get it's that. bittersweet let's uh... but but so i thought i accepted this song as a breather and i didn't mind it as much as you guys did um moving on to the track afterwards which we ha- we'll probably have quite a bit more to say this is it as it shows on itunes it's three asterisks three stars <laughs> flawless and it's featuring and i'm going to try not to butcher this it's um Kaimanda Ngozi Adichie. Um, this is another song competing for best song. And this one is more upon the conceptual side. Because this is a great, probably the best I've heard in four or five years, this is a great woman empowerment song. Just to all women. This She did a beautiful job really trying to create the perfect song a child should listen to growing up. Because it starts with... And yeah, there's cursing, and that's going to raise the age group. It starts with her going on about her hometown growing up. I made myself who I am. So y'all can go do things to yourself. Goes into part two, which is a speech about... Feminism and how women should be empowered and should be taught the same as men. Or maybe boys should be taught how girls are. Because women are taught that marriage is important. That you have to find a suitable mate. But men are taught 
you have to find a suitable job and you have to make money. Like the the there's no equality between what we're geared towards in the, life. This whole section is spoken by the author whose name I butchered at the beginning of the title of the song. Um, and it it's clearly stating, you know, making the important point that feminism is not about putting women first. It's about making, about true equality. Well, the ideal brand of feminism, yeah, yes. Yeah, and Well, that's what I'm saying, yes. Part three goes into, with the, it starts with the lines, you wake up, Flawless. Put on flawless. She's just going on. Every woman is a flawless diamond. Every part of their lives. The the, the husband they find. The job they lead. Everything that they do. The house they have. The life they live is flawless. Because that's how a woman should feel. Well, me and Matt had a little bit of discrepancies on that. Just because of the delivery of the phrase. Uh that it almost strikes me as the kind of thing you'd have to convince yourself of in that yeah. position. The, 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 Especially the, in Beyonce's position. The difference to me was that the delivery of it, ca- it came back to having that kind of chip on your shoulder feel. It very much sounded like we're almost as if we're expected to be flawless, you know, because we're who we are. That's we what have, I got all We from. have to be you flawless see. in every nature. But that's, I did not, the fact that it starts with the lines... You wake up flawless. That right there, that line right there tells me I can't take it that way. You see, but that's this the line more, that makes me take line, it. Exactly. That's the line that makes me take it that way. I feel the idea like, that, you know, most people wake up with messed up hair. Exactly. But it There's, starts... That's no, joke. that's the whole thing. No you one wakes should, up like that. <laughs> no, 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 no. That's the whole thing. You're supposed to accept waking up all crusty from sleep and everything like that. You're still flawless. You should feel like a diamond every moment of every day. You should not be held down I, because you're supposed to look a certain way or supposed to act a certain way or supposed to get married or supposed to get a husband. The last, the, towards the end, my uh, mama taught me, no, mama taught us good home training. My daddy taught me how to love haters. My sister taught me I should speak my mind. My man made me uh, feel so damn fine. That's her mother, her father, her sister taught her things. Her husband had nothing to teach her. Okay, fair enough. As far as influences, obviously, you get in your past, and then you should, ideally, and everyone should be a, a fairly com- quote-unquote complete person by the time you're ready to actually take the, the step toward marriage. I accept that. I don't know. There's, um... Like, I, I want to... If I indulge that that perspective there... I don't know. This is just a little bit of a tricky one because it's the way that functions against the material that is spoken by uh, by the featured uh, guest, the fe- featured singer at the end, or speaker. Because that material is more about the academic perspective. Like, this is what is taught. Which is strange that it should be generalized from Beyonce's perspective to simply tell you or tell you whether you're a girl or boy, you wake up flawless. Because, of course, we all don't. At, it's no, odd at that point. At this point, it's almost like someone looking in the mirror, building up their self-esteem, saying it to themselves. That's how I look at this third part. Yeah, it's, yeah You no. psyching yourself up. But I don't get that. From the delivery and the way it's sung, I get what Steve gets. I feel... She's saying it as if it's almost, this is impossible. Nobody wakes up flawless. No one should expect that. Yeah, exactly. no one should expect that of you to be flawless your entire life. Which means that I think there's, there's, there's the other level there is, is it, it's predominantly a song about how women are seen. Which means that women, of course, are the ones that are expected to, that's, that's the, 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 um, the delivery here. It's that women are expected to look beautiful instantly and that's why I feel like that's some more direct connection also the other point that I have to make, make is fun of that typically when something a word or a line has stars like that in front of it it's for you to refer somewhere else to read a full definition of what that means in that context I think that's why that supports me and Steve's theory this song is not as face value as the word flawless which mm. means without flaw would entail uh, I, I think, it, yeah, in the end, this is probably flawless, period, or quote-unquote 
flawless. Yeah. And this is actually going to be a good point to talk uh, for, for our later segment after the album. Because we're going to get into why we're having some of these discrepancies. Yes. But moving on to the next track, Superpower. Featuring Frank Ocean. So this song does something a little interesting for the record at this point. Um, there is a fair amount of acapella in the mix on this track. Um, which I'm assuming is Frank Ocean. Um, I actually didn't check that, but I'm going to take a safe bet that it's him doing the acapella work. We dropped the bomb on that? <laughs> yeah, we dropped the ball on that. Oh, yeah. Dropping well, the, the bomb is not the same thing. <laughs> I misspoke. It happens. Once in a while. Um, I did, I once every a once in a while. I did a lot. But um, it was it was kind of a, an introspective-ish song. It was very kind of lovey-dovey. It was, at its core... The concept of love overcoming all bo- all all problems. It really was talking about Beyonce and Jay Z now together. Can it's tough love. It can withstand getting hit, withstand pressure, pain. It can keep going. I'll give it this. I I yet again was engaged with the background music. It was kind of ethereal. I'd say. Um, Again, there's kind of that running theme. Well, not in every single case here. It's either they're going full force uh, catchy, or they're really, really, really pulling it back and um, expressing something a little bit more low-key. This definitely took that route. I want to say for that reason it had a lot more potential than it did, as far as a mood-setting piece. But I took some issues with overall form here. I feel like they just didn't go far enough with that. This was less for the album because they weren't Beyonce's not crossing the genres like she was in a lot of the previous work this became a little bit too pop in design it was very safe in that respect in in yes in overall form like the way the way certain sections were working together in terms of of chordal complexity though there were, there was there was so much potential i really really want to like it for that reason it was um it kind of did remind me of uh of goldfrap a little bit uh there are tales of us which we did back in episode 64 that that kind of had the similar tone um in terms of a very and, and actually when you consider some of the uh, theme work on that album in terms of you know love loss and yes there was a little bit of empowerment there and everything um I could kind of understand that her taking that route uh, with with musical tone. Yeah. But, I don't know. The song just seemed to be missing something. Like, I had trouble putting my finger on it, but I just wasn't as engaged in this song as in other tracks. It wasn't bad, per se, but I just... There was something missing. Thing. We it getting... was the fact that, that those... Those chord changes implied there to be direction and, pro- and progression where there just wasn't any. Yeah. And it was coupled by... Beyonce's beautiful voice with really just good lyrics. Nothing special, nothing to write home about. It 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 got the point across, but it really didn't have any of the illusions we got in some of the previous tracks or any of the really frank nature we got in the previous tracks. Yeah. And that was a little bit of a disappointment. Yeah, I'm not, I don't want to be too on the surface with this, but it is hard for me to get past a couple of things. Well, first of all, again... Background music, absolutely gorgeous. Want to really, really stress that because it could have been such a great selling point for this track over even most of the tracks in the album. I think some of the background mixing here was really stellar, uh, especially in certain moments where it really, really piqued my interest. Uh, but the big thing here, I think, was actually the acapella, the 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 duh duh, you know, do 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 all that. I don't know. It didn't really blend. It yeah, was kind of it, it was a little, a little off to broken, me. Yeah. Especially, it worked against that that uh, that background music. You know, I ethereal think, doesn't really work with acapella. I think it was trying to do some sort of a heartbeat idea. It didn't right. quite come across uh, enough for that. Fair enough. This song seemed a little disjointed, but all in all, it was an okay track. Just nothing to really write home about. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> speaking of of writing home, so track fourteen, <laughs> heaven. Um, as as friends of mine who are future guests to come on the show, um, Kim and Sage say, it hit me right in the feels. This song is um, a very sad track. It's essentially about Beyonce's miscarriage with her unborn child. And before even knowing that, 
I was in love with the beautiful sadness in this song. And to be honest, I got nothing to say. This is just heart-wrenching pain it's, it's in a beautiful, almost cathartic uh, presentation. Certainly must have been cathartic for her. Yeah. Um, it's it almost be... a strange choice to use the considering theme or word choice, but... I... Well, it might also be cathartic for someone who's going through the same thing. That's true. Um, I, I will say a little bit about this track, because this goes back to um, what I'm really harping on here. That's marriage of... of Music and lyrics, marriage of of the two of the the two entities together. Um, this was pretty clever, considering how incredibly simple it was. Just a single piano note, a, a melody that follows along just single notes at a time. That's a very strange thing to hear in the beginning of a piece because it's a it's a bold move. It's something so thin down, you know. A- anyone could just you know hammer out a couple notes with one finger on the piano. And it, it sort of is a nice signature as to how really low key this tr- this track is. It's yeah. it's a profound kind of sadness. Like that's all you can muster is just lift a finger in order to to play that that sad uh, soundtrack to your life uh, uh, during a crucial uh, uh, depri- deprivating moment. But the outlook, the line, heaven couldn't wait, and the repetition of heaven couldn't wait for you was just so heart-wrenching and and shows not necessarily moving on but just acceptance. Yeah, and acceptance and understanding, you know, uh, where where what's fair and what's not doesn't come into play but just this acceptance of this happened and that and this is why. Um it it when I when I think of something that is related to faith and religion. This is the kind of song I think of where this is something mm. this is she's using her faith in what she believes to go on to move forward and I would never fault anybody for that. Regardless of my beliefs, this is a beautiful sentiment in a bittersweet song. And it it even ends with uh uh her saying in Spanish the Lord's prayer, which by that point and I recognized it um by that point, I was getting close to tears because it was just so much, so pointed, and I, I, it was we it was beautiful. Religious was religious beautiful. themes are very are very powerful, um, especially to 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 a literary end uh, because of well, just as you said, the greater faith there and the faith that you would have to have in 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 an instant where you you know the unborn child, uh, which. Never got to see the light of day, and you you would the best you can hope. The only thing you can hope is that I'll have some some semblance of future. It's very it's very very powerful and emotional to evoke the Lord's prayer. Yeah, this song is. I mean, it's it's definitely one of the most emotional songs we've heard, and it's in at the wire. It's just there's there's no way to deny the emotion in this song. It's, it's clearly it's, one of the most personal things she's ever wrote, for and sure. it's 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 just straight up beautiful. Yeah, it's it's gorgeous, and it it's followed up because I'm I'm very thankful she didn't leave us on this downer with a love story, a, a, a love ballad to her Daughter. brother, uh, child Blue Ivy. Yeah, this is the song Blue, featured by Blue Ivy. Funnily enough, um, the lead singer, Justin Furstenfeld, of Blue October, has a daughter named Blue. Also wrote a song called Blue, dedicated to her. Um, so this song, Blue, <clears throat> is a, a song from a mother to a daughter done right. Um, what I mean by that is we've had in the past other artists write these songs about their children. That's and either a letter to their future. Well, because they seem they don't seem... They seem somewhat personal, but they don't they don't necessarily carry very well. Um, but this song conveys the sweet message. It's beautifully written, and 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 the music is beautiful to go with it. It's it's very much the envision and empowerment of love between a mother and her child. It was a very swooning song for that region. Yeah. It's full of life, love, virility. I mean, this yeah. is this is really the. The sweet end to the empowerment uh, album, which is is where I'm going to lead this into the, into the overall arc here. Uh, I mean, obviously, this this really shouldn't even 
this is not even trying to be elusive. This is very obvious. It was a self-titled album, which after her long career, she's titling a surprise album, Beyonce. It's essentially everything that, that has made her the woman who she is. Yeah. And a lot yeah. of that does uh, fall under empowerment and the strength that she has to have, of course, as, as an artist. Um, it's very, very personal for that reason. So obviously, yeah. everything we talk about is, is you can't really fault any of it because it's, it's all her. Um, but you take uh, many of these tracks into account, um, you're going through all the different stages. You're going through you're going through the love, the sex, of course, and then you're going through the loss, um, and finally her role as a mother. That's a pretty powerful arc because it's an autobiography. How else? I mean, you can't really screw that up in terms this, of an arc. This album is totally autobiographical, and for the fact that they clo- she closes with the future. This and child is the future. Of course. And the, the lines, looking towards it. The lines, each day I feel so blessed to be looking at you, because when you open your eyes, I feel alive. Like, that you is are. an incredibly beautiful sentiment. Life and virility. I mean, that's what you really what you need in the end. Even if the Lord's Prayer doesn't quite pick you up from the, uh, from the, uh, the sad marks in your life that that that's certainly something that does look to your child look to the living look to the future of your family and all that that's about all you can do in the end yeah it's definitely a strong very strong way to close and while the intro to the album wasn't maybe the strongest intro the closer is definitely very strong and i think a great way to end the record and it at times i mean it really does seem uh i guess not just autobiographic uh uh Autobiographical. <laughs> Autobiographical. Uh, it also seems like it actually follows her age as it moves along. Yeah, it's very uh, personal. Pretty, uh, pretty hurts young child idea. Ghost haunted could speak to her actual childhood and 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 the issues. I don't she know. Had I there. don't know that I want to make that clear arc in a chronological order. I don't necessarily. I get think. That. Actually, I think no, it, I'm, kind of might... bu- I'm kind of buying the chronolo- chronology here. Uh, Especially drunken love. Drunken love is 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 really that teenager kind of love. Like and it blow. really has very little. Yeah, blow. Of course, that's just that's blind love, teenager, adolescent love, and sex. That's hormones. That's both combined there. I. It really does have a progression in terms of maturity. It gets much more mature as it goes on. Well, yeah. I mean, uh, the, last... the, the love the love themes themselves. So perhaps you know. Again, even though I may not be down with blow as a song. Uh, it it definitely does have its place in this album, because by the time you move to her other, uh, love her other love tracks like, like Rocket or like Mine, it it's it's much more of a um, in a in a vault perspective. It definitely matures. Well, there's no deniability about the maturity, considering Heaven and Blue are the most mature songs on the record. I mean, dealing with it's that level of loss and then this beautiful life. That's current events yeah. essentially yeah and it's exactly it is the most recent events i mean pretty hurts uh i believe it was pretty hurts starts with um her being interviewed with a very old uh, talking about talking, about talking about talking about her really early work yeah uh yeah, her ghost, being discovered as a child ghost haunted i believe started with like her, her receiving a, an award when she was a child. Yeah, I mean, it really does undergo that progression. And for that, and I'll, I guess I'll start the wrap up. I this is this is a really an amazing album. To be to be frank, it really is an amazing album. You uh, can't be frank. You're John. Oh, oh my, my god. god. <laughs> to be frank, because that's who I want to be. <laughs> It's his life's long ambition. It's <laughs> don't shit on it. <laughs> it's phenomenal because I have to give her respect for really taking all the stuff that the tabloids have put out there, all that stuff, and being and just putting it into an album and just saying, you know my life story, but here is it from my perspective. Um, musically, not all of it was my taste. Some of it was a little repetitive. But the worst parts of the music were kind of supplemented by the better parts of the vocal and lyrical work. And to some extent, vice versa. The most interesting musical work kind of had just okay lyrical and, well, yeah, good to great to awesome Beyonce singing. But it's, it's, 
I, I expect that. I can't even I can't even say that's that's an allure at this point. It's Beyonce. It better be awesome. Who wouldn't expect that? Um Theme is great. The arc is is solid. It's through and through. Uh and honestly, when we were listening to Ghost Haunted, I was telling Matt, I need my own copy of this album because this is I don't like pop. I really don't like pop, but I really want to hear this again. This is something I I kind of want to sit on again. Um, for that reason, for all the the real, the tears, the 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 words, the vocals, the music that was thrown into this, uh, four two five. This is this is probably the best pop album I've heard in pff, ever, uh, or at least in modern day pop. Best 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 pop album I've heard in modern modern style. It's it's beautiful. Just the prese- presentation alone gives it you know, point oh five. It's it's really just a solid great piece. Okay. This this album is a really, really tricky one for me. Then again I always enjoy the kind of albums where uh where you end up talking about the art and the kinds of ones that also really challenge the objective and the subjective because you have to invoke a lot of objectivity when you're talking about an autobiographical piece because it requires you completely taking yourself out of yourself and putting yourself into the life of the person you're hearing it from from the horse's mouth this is Beyonce (laughs) that's the title you really can't accept it for anything else but that that said I mean it's still an album released to the masses, so you have to accept on how it's, you know, on how it's being delivered, how it's going to be taken from all your different circles. I will say that based on my experience with Beyonce's previous work, this is definitely a step up. Um, perhaps just because it's a little bit more, I, I detect the genuine nature. I mean, when you're talking about yourself, then things are bound to be a little bit more straightforward. Now, of course, many of her songs, I'm sure, are are semi-autobiographical, or at least have some semblance, but then, of course, there's always those tracks that are just pop tracks, and you know they're going to sell, and she's got a great voice, so it's just like a match made for Billboard Heaven. This this steps away from that, which is why I couldn't take it. It's just a, a standard pop album. That said, it does have a few pop tracks. Um... And I think that's really what's going to hold this album back for me a little bit, is uh, the lost potential here. I, there's so many things in this album that just, they they want greatness. They really want it. I feel it in the moment-to-moment basis, and I was, I was so optimistic. I, I had this album almost written off as a, uh, a written on, as, as a, as a, as a high four-star album based on track two, because of how how alluring that that track haunted was it it really was just it was <laughs> it's a really tricky one to describe it's 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 a journey in of itself but it's a dark dark journey you go from one segment to the next and i i'm never quite sure where it's going to go at the same time each and every transition it was the first track i've heard in quite a long time where every transition seemed perfectly natural uh from a sound engineering perspective that's somewhat masterful considering very often when you're working with a loop machine, as many pop tracks do, it's very easy to fall into the trap of, uh, you know, bring back the chorus on a dime, regardless of whether it worked with the previous section, but we're running short on time here, so being a pop track, we kind of got to cut to the chase and go big, go fast. That was the problem with the intro, but Haunted did it beautifully. Well, there were many tracks that were over five minutes on this record. They took their time with... Oh, for sure they took their time, but even so, within that, uh, there were many other tracks apart from Haunted. That is the big exception here. Apart from Haunted, there were many tracks which uh, tended to play the safe route for their entirety. They still were kind of strict with the verse-chorus structure, and I feel like they didn't really accentuate many of her, her most emotional parts that could have perhaps uh, burgeoned into something um, something greater, something magical. Something magical, there you are. The strong suit in this album is the arc. That's been said. That That's really where this album does shine, because from a story perspective, that is really unique for a pop album, which often is just a, a hodgepodge of this or that. This is more of a hodgepodge of genres, which combine to form 
a very solid autobiographical uh, life life story. That's all redundant. <laughs> but there you are. I, I gotta leave this... I think I gotta put this at a 3.9. Just shy of a 4 because of of the potential that was lost there. I, I'm really only looking at one song that I really love and uh, and of course the haunt actually, you know, I'm going to uh, I'm going to throw in Heaven there. I think both tracks were just so genuine. Well, <clears throat> at least Heaven for its genuine nature and Haunted for its um for its complexity. For what it for what it did to me what I really did not expect. So I stick with 3.9 in as much as it it was really going great places, and it still really is a good album. That's a better that's a better than average score. Um, you know, I just it could have been more. It could have been a little bit better on song to song. Um, I mean, more or less, what could be said has been said as far as a wrap up goes. This album, though, I mean, emotionally, in just about every song. No, I'd say, yeah, even the ones that I didn't love as much. Just about every song, except maybe Superhero, which felt a little empty to me. But just about every other... Or Superpower, rather. Every other song, I got some semblance of something. Beyonce was putting out an emotion, and I felt it. You know, it was very clear, whether it was from the chip on her shoulder, the aggressive drunk love song, to the sincere love, to the the sex, the raw sex, to the more passionate sex... I mean, it's all there. There's emotion from start to finish on this record. It's 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 ble- a bleeding heart. She opened a vein to write this record, and of course, towards the end, "Heaven in Blue" clearly portray that because those songs are so undeniably personal, completely and undeniably personal. Um, so, I mean, from an emotional level, this song is one of the more emotional albums we've definitely uh, reviewed. That said. You know, from a lyric standpoint, there was a lot of cleverness. There was some stuff that was a little less clever than others. From a music standpoint, a good chunk of it was completely unlike what I expected. Knowing her previous work... uh, A good chunk of it was probably light years ahead of the pop nomaker. And the fact that she released this... Sure. (laughs) Sure. The fact that she released this... As a surprise, with no promotion, with 14 music videos to go along with it, which I'm now going to go out of my way to watch after this, I just, it's its incredible what she's doing here. And if this is the future of Beyonce, and this is where she's taking her career, I can't wait to see what she does next. I'm so excited, because she could be the next definable pop star. I mean, she already is. Yeah, that's, but that's already, you know. She is, but it could be the, that, remember we were talking about that next level of pop and what the hell that could be? In the direction she's going, she might be able to find that next step where the genre is going as popular music goes. Um, I I disagree slightly with Steve. I think it, it is worthy of a four plus. I think, you know, I understand where your rating falls, but for me, especially for an emotional standpoint, you know, there are many moments on this album where I felt what she was... I related and felt what she was going through, even though it was a very personal story. So for me, this is um, a 4-5. Um, wow. I'm putting it up there because there were very few tracks that I didn't like. You know, I, I liked to loved most of this record. And as far as an emotional standpoint goes, you know, Heaven... I was very shy of bawling just because it's so sad and just so pers- so personal. There's no doubt. Heaven and, and Haunted, to me, are gems yeah. uh, for two completely different reasons. Yes. Uh, it's just many of the other tracks broached one or one of those reasons. One of those yeah. two reasons. Those are the two opposite ends of the spectrum. And the rest of the tracks, I feel like, were working hand in hand to to go toward one and toward the other. I really loved loved many of the messages of empowerment yeah. in there. There really are. It is, it is. Some of it was a little bit repetitive, a little bit. Um, I don't want to say outdated. That's the wrong word because it's always it's a it's a never dying message. But it is um, familiar. F- familiar, yeah. There's you know there's only so many ways you can say certain. Uh, <laughs> there's only so many ways you can say the word empowerment. So on a buy it, forget it. Okay, you like pop, buy it. You'll love this. Um, 
if you like never know, anything. it might be too deep for people who just eat up pop. Actually, <laughs> if you like Beyonce's any, if you like a single one of her songs, buy this. There you are. Uh, and I would actually make this a listen to everybody else, even the death metal fans, because I, I can't say this enough. I don't like pop, and I'm gonna be listening to this. That's, and you know what? That's something. This is your this is your weekly Steve revises his rating <laughs> segment. Uh, I am going to push it up for one elephant in the room here. Her vocal style. I mean, she's just such a damn good singer. She's it's still. A, it's she's Beyonce. She's Beyonce. She's Beyonce. Yeah. There's that. And she's as good here as she ever was, if not even a little better, because of the interesting styles in which she was singing, mm-hmm. regardless of just her singing ability. So, four. Four, okay. four, four. There you are. Um, br- what, John? And now I want to move on to something you said earlier. I said something earlier? Yes, and oh, I'm trying to remember it. You said that she was sort of, maybe this is the way forward, maybe this is the new thing, and... I kind of only see this as like a one-shot deal. I cannot see her actually trying to take this depth as the next step in pop. And the reason for that is we haven't even mentioned the videos in an hour. There's a lot of videos for it. This this is really meant to be just watched while and heard at the same time. We're That's, taking some creative liberties with this uh, with this review here. I mean, what we do but, is we're an audio podcast. We want to make sure it stands up to your ears this album you bought with videos that's a major component here and I'm sure it, it, it might be worse it might be better I expect it might actually be full fledged movie style by the time wa- you, you watch it with all the videos um, but video is a weird component to have with music it's not a weird to, a component for videos to have music but it's weird the other way around I can only speculate the kind of video that would be out for Blow. <laughs> and there is one. There, I, we know there there's is. one. It's uh, it's it's just weird to to say that the the aud- the visual stuff is an accessory for the auditorial pieces because that's not the norm by any stretch. I mean, there's always been since the late '80s music videos or mid '80s, late '80s, whatever '70s. Some of late seventies, late seventies. Okay, so there's... unless you count some of those Beatles ones, then hey, late sixties. But those were really, really, you know, kind of progenitors. And if you want to go even <laughs> further back, Elvis. The point is, <laughs> music videos have kind of always, at some point, played a part in music culture. But it's not often that entire albums are based around video. For example, John mentioned earlier off the air when I brought this this idea up, um, "The Wall" by Pink Floyd, which is all about. The, the the movie that goes with it, um, but was it released simultaneously? No, it wasn't. Neither was uh, uh, another old piece, Yellow Submarine. These these had the videos done afterwards. Uh, same for for uh, Help. Video movie came out afterwards, but after a very short period of time of the video being released, the the albums themselves became intrinsically linked to these videos yes and no but I wanna this is very very interesting because you mentioned the wall and my experience of the wall was never watching the film believe it or not I've never seen the film hmm. I, maybe I've seen like clips of it here and there I think I know the, the general uh, artistic style of it but I would beg to differ that they're intrinsically linked I think the wall itself was conceived as such a visual style of music it's a, it's really more of a play. You could almost kind of imagine it being a play, which easily, easily, you know, works on an album. They used to record plays and, and put them on vinyl back in the day. And that's a great point, because when Pink Floyd was performing this album, they would routinely build a wall in front of the band, and throughout the show, have little skits and break through the wall. <laughs> this was it was actually a big thing and became almost uh, a performance piece. Yeah, it, it, it that's, was. That's see, there you are. So this could very well be a first as far as a simultaneous album released with music videos accompaniment. Well, it depends on how you look at it. Um, but re- real quick, I do want to I do want to p- 
put in the opposite thing. Because just if I were to indulge you and say that that the wall was intrinsically linked, or if, if at least in the in the in the minds of those of, present at its release, those present and and people today, and the way whether whether for the people that have grown up with the wall, uh, the movie. If you take that they were intrinsically released, then you have to come up with the opposite, which is something that uh, really you could take as a concept album. Because on the face of it, you could say that a concept album lends itself to a visual medium automatically. So take another uh, concept album, such as Sgt. Pepper. Sgt. Pepper... You you do have visual things that come to mind in the album because some things are just you know for the benefit of Mr. Kite you know you're at the circus here it is it is a very fanciful show there are lots of very visual elements in that album and yet the only thing that really did live up to the album well no the only thing that tried to ever live up to the album was the movie Sergeant Pepper which is somewhat of a travesty hodgepodge of a film where you bring in so many random actors, and it never really filled out any cohesive storyline. It felt like it was trying to apply meaning where there was none, because it is an album, first and foremost. And that's right. that's where visuals really don't blend. Right. I think that it, it's okay. kind of a case-by-case case basis. Interjection. I recommend that everyone watch the movie Sgt. Pepper. It's hilarious, but that's from a Mystery Science Theater perspective, which I'll... Just not touch. <laughs> yes, that's not that's not our our gig for sure. Um, no, I, I see I see what you mean, and 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 I and I definitely get that. I think that again, though, what's more most attractive to Beyonce's Beyonce is that it was released overnight with the same amount of music videos to accompany the same amount of songs. And which I don't know any other artist, artist ever doing. While uh, Green Day's American Idiot, which is a lot of people hailed as like a resurgence of the concept album, speaking to, to Steve's uh, relationship to Sgt. Pepper, they did a series of between four and six videos that were all actually linked. They had the uh, similar or the same characters, and if you watch them back to back to back, it actually was a single progressing storyline. And the whole album was designed around a single progressing storyline. Uh, yeah, listening to front to back, yeah, each song's different, but there are a lot of heavy theme work done in there. So that's actually why it's my favorite Green Day album. So similar to the way Beyonce <laughs> stated in 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 her preview, her interview, that that it's really not interpreted, not interpretive. She doesn't mean this album to be interpretive. She means it to be very face value because it is her. Yeah. And well, that's she, sort of the similar to what you're describing with Green Day never really intended anything other than what was there. Yeah. You have a storyline, that's it. Yes, well, you can interpret was, within that, but there is something set. You're, it's well, not a matter of... The videos themselves are very artistic and interpretive in, by themselves. Yeah, it's not a matter uh, of they're, deception They're, they're kind, of, kind of weird, uh, kind of a little bit off the wall. But Beyonce actually did <laughs> say it uh, did say it very well in, in one of her interviews. This album... Well, no. When she sings, she has a visual idea of what she's singing about. That's actually why she did this album the way she did it. She right. made the videos because she wanted to show everybody what she saw when the words left her mouth. Right. And that's and, actually a very interesting concept. The idea that these are... You don't know that every yeah. artist, when they write a song, they visualize something as well. The fact that for every song she wrote for this record, she had a clear vision is is very interesting. Yeah, I do want to... There, there's an interesting distinction here. Between a visual album or a visual medium that is meant to go with music, I, I feel like we're being a little too specific with that because, of course, if you were to just take that generally, then there's so many other things that match it. For instance, musical theater itself. You know, no, I know. That, of course, is music that's meant to be built around it. This is just kind of an interesting middle ground that, that she found. Yeah. I mean, I'm not speaking to that, because obviously soundtracks to movies and all that stuff falls But in that it. case, it's it's a visual component that has an auditory component added on. Yeah. And we've... But talking about these albums, they were auditory pieces that had visual components added on. This really is... To speak with Storm said earlier... Yeah, it's kind of a new idea. I don't think it can really be done and perpetuated too much. 
But this was not one or the other. This wasn't a chicken or an egg kind of a situation. This this album really was unique in that it was designed to be both from the inception, which is very, very different. Well, Everything had to match up at the same time. Well, that's the thing. Are you in t- <laughs> are these videos intended to be played chronologically in the same way that the yep. album is meant? Yep. Yep. Yeah, there yes, you are. Yes, they are. So there's your movie. <laughs> yeah, it's, this is from from what from the clips I saw. It's 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 a combination of music video plus home movies. It it, it looks very interesting. Right. Definitely something we'll have to check out and speak to in the new year. I don't want to make it entirely. I don't want to make it entirely speculative, but um, for sure, when you're, we're talking about uh, music meeting um, the visual in a general sense, I, I feel like that concept was really. Uh, it was started in the '60s in somewhat of a general way because of that whole psychedelic effect. Right. Well, that and the fact that people now own TVs very often, and there was one in almost every home by then. They yeah. were all over the place, <laughs> so they could get away with it. Yeah. Well, I suppose that says about all because we just wanted to sort of hash the uh, the concept here, which is is, is definitely original. Yes, in itself. Um, <clears throat> before we move on to uh, what we're doing next week, <clears throat> Steve, do you have another wonderful or hateful or questionable mail? You sound so excited. You you covered you all it. your bases right there. That's it's, right. It's, now, now this, you, my gonna, tone is a general I'm sick tone, not a I'm disinterested tone. You're either going to love it or you're going to hate it or you're just going to think it's okay. Well, let's see if they manage to uh, to go around you. <clears throat> fantastic goods from you, man. I have understand your stuff previous to and you are just too fantastic. I really like what you've acquired here, certainly like what you are stating, and the way in which you say it. You make it enjoyable, and you still care for the for to keep it wise. I can't wait to read far more from you. This is actually a terrific website by Schwarzbunte Engel. See, my problem with with stuff like this is that they make a comment like this, but they post it on a picture, and it's like it was on a picture. Well, I can guarantee you, it was. Yeah. Uh, word the uh, choices are kind of messed up, but the whole thing is that. It doesn't stick with one type of medium. It, it, it's it's trying to get the idea of we're producing goods by writing our our our, our uh-huh. podcast. Uh-huh. It's uh-huh. just a yeah, weird thought, yeah. comment. It, uh-huh. It's just yeah. weird. Yeah. yeah, I got you. Okay, I got you. Uh-huh. All right. So I will dissect would... one line though. I absolutely love that. I think that is probably perhaps the nicest thing that has ever been said to us by any spam. I really like what you've acquired here certainly like what you're stating and the way in which you said it. I think they're covering all bases. You thought you were covering all bases by trying to uh, trying to guess guesswork here, but that that's everything. Now, that, that's did, the be- we, we could did, close up shop. We've done everything there is to do as Crash Chords. And that's a great way to end we're the done. new year. Now, um, uh, so next week, we have a present for you guys. It's a surprise. Um, tune in for that, and then of course we'll have a, uh, a new episode of course on... Uh, the day before New Year's as well. So right before we ring in the New Year, we'll bring you our year in review like we always do. Next week, a special present. Um, I want to say at the end of the show, also, I'll probably bring this up again in the New Year. I really like how we've grown as a website, and I hope to keep growing. I appreciate what both of you guys have done for the podcast and for the website. And I'm thankful for the fans who listen, for those who share us on social media and put us and you know get us out there. And I'm, I'm thankful for the guests we've had on. We've had a lot of good guests this year. It has been a very good year in, of guests, and we already have some guests coming up for the New Year scheduled coming up as well. We had a lot of good albums and a lot of greatly bad albums. So you'll hear all of that uh, come New Year's. Yes. So thank in you. Our year in review. And be as, prepared. <laughs> be prepared. That almost never mind. <laughs> That's like a warning. Yeah. It's That's fair. like caution. It's fine. Please do not do this at home. We're going to tell you what we really think now, (laughs) after all these episodes. On that note, music is life, and And life life is is good. good.